and we're, we're so appreciative to have you here. And um, I know that everyone is so excited to, to come and um, hear some of your poetry and um, hear the conversation. So um, before we really begin, um, please, please, please buy a copy of the book, What is Otherwise Infinite. Um, so good as you'll hear today. And um, I hope that you can purchase a copy either from your local independent bookstore or directly from the publisher or via bookshop.org. I think a link to bookshop is going in the chat. Thank you, Zach. Um, and we also welcome audience questions. So please put questions in the chat, um, the chat window, and then I'll try to get to as many of your questions as possible throughout the conversation. Um, I much prefer audience questions over my own, though I do have plenty to ask. So um, we won't have any, any shortage of things to talk about. So I'm so excited to welcome you all to the Writer Center virtual craft chat series, where we talk with writers a little less about what they wrote and a little more about how they wrote it. And please welcome tonight's guest, Bianca Stone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, could you just kick us off by reading a poem or two from the new book? And then we'll kind of jump in from there. Yes, I'd be happy to. And thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to start with, uh, the malady. It's allergies of the soul. When it's too late, you notice your face has fallen. Pills moved around in your hand. You don't know where you are or what you've done with your time, which you know is unfathomably precious, but you're not sure in what way or what to do with it. And I suspect when you read this, it will have already taken me. Even now it knows I know. It watches through the very young who have so recently escaped the overwhelming original cure and come into this world. My toddler, climbs up on a rock and turns to look at me. She sees how I suffer from it, how I slink from screen to screen with it, how my books will not come to fruition because of it, how it keeps me from never being enough. And the other one I'll read is, um, the way things were up until now. I'm bored of all the excuses. Bored as Mayakovsky at the finished painter's exhibition, barking like a dog through the foreign minister's toast until he cried and sat down. Deadly serious. I am bored as an elegy. I mean, why care at all speaking as a pitfall in a world of pits, but we do to the death. We all agree to garden this year, and my raspberry bushes picked over by wrens, I'll make them great again and let America go wild. It'll be all trumpets and leeks and lilacs from here on out. Let's stop paying for it, get it free. Let's plan our victory gardens to supplement grief, boost morale, as though something new and uncontrolled were available. It is the original, new, hot, future joy. We're making it out of dough. And the illusion of separateness, let it go back into remission. Just look at you. You look like a resurrected child, a serious drama in a cosmic joke, scarred, masked, dangerous. And what of the new Eucharist? How hungry I always am, how I long to lack though in Walmart, my heart beats a little faster. I want the world to heal up. And the world is a field, as if it were indeed flat, curving and caving, as if it were a piece of paper, a Gustave Dore engraving from the Divina Commedia, the one with the silhouettes of Dante and Beatrice, standing in front of the blinding, exploding white rose that you realize when looking more closely 
is all made up of bodies and wings twisting together. The saintly throng, they call it, mashed and hurtling, an image of heaven and the creation of angels, though it is frenzied as any image of hell around a divine nipple, Odin's lost eye in the well, the drain to the other side, joy that gets more frantic the more you try to quiet it down. Thank you. Thank you so much for reading those poems, um, two of my favorites of the collection, if I, if I had to pick. Um, but um, I'm so excited to, to really get to dive into sort of the meat and bones and maybe talk about some of your other work as well. Um, before we really jump in, could you just tell us who you are um, in your own words and, and sort of what brought you to poetry? Sure. Um, I'm Bianca Stone. I primarily write poetry. It's been something I've done my entire life. Ever since I was a small child, I grew up with, um, I was partially raised by my grandmother um, and I, she was a poet and my mother wrote fiction. And, um, and so there was a lot of creative writing in my household. Um, and it was something I was good at um, from very early on and in that I was very comfortable doing it um, and had uh, confidence in doing it. Um, whereas I really wasn't very good in school at very much else. Um, and so, yeah, I, I I also do visual art um, and I did that for, I did it pretty seriously for many years in congruence with my poetry and I, I gave it a name, Poetry Comics. And I, I've been, I was doing that for a very long time. I've sort of drifted away from visual art and um, become I've just very, in the past few years, very focused on other things. But um, yeah, I, I, I love, um, I love doing comics and painting and drawing. And I also run the Ruth Stone House nonprofit here in Vermont. And we are a poetry nonprofit and we do podcasts, we do online classes, we do a weekly free workshop um, online. And um, we are very dedicated to promoting and furthering poetry in the arts. Um, so I've built my life around poetry and um, yeah. Great, great, thank you. And um, thank you so much for for kind of going back and, and I'm sure we'll probably talk about the, the intersection of art and poetry a little bit more later on. Um, but I did wanna kind of start with our probably most difficult question just because it's a little bit um, not a typical question. So. You know, I always like to say that as poets, we're, we're really in the business of noticing things. Um, so this question is a little bit about, you know, noticing things in your own work. So is there something that you do in your poetry, maybe across books or across certain poems, um, consciously, unconsciously, um, some kind of habit or craft element that you, that you write into or even write against? Yeah, I think that's a really wonderful and intriguing question. And I think um, there's a lot about my poetry that uh, I don't notice what I'm doing until much later. And, and actually fairly recently, I've been noticing a lot more about my poetry because I've been learning how to notice what I'm saying more um, through um, psychodynamic therapy. So interestingly, uh, we do so many things unconsciously uh, in our life and what comes out of our mouth. And uh, it's really interesting to look back at your work and be like, oh, wow, I didn't notice that I was I didn't even know what I was exactly saying in this poem. I thought I did, but now looking back, I see that there was a lot, there was a lot more there that I wasn't aware of the, the symbolism that falls out of us. 
um, is pretty astounding. And poetry, of course, is one of the most amazing places to start noticing um, what your mind is concerned with. And it's really interesting to, to think about, obviously I'm avoiding your question right now, but <laughs> um, it's really interesting to notice what other people notice about your work too. If you're lucky enough to hear um, feedback about it, um, if people notice something that you were doing intentionally, uh, for me, that's one of the most exciting things is that it really means your poem. It, to me, it means your poems are really working. At the same time, people are going to notice things that you didn't notice. And that's also fun and surprising. Um, and, it, and it's also hard because you feel like it's a failure if people never talk about something that you really mm -hmm. thought was like obvious in your poem. My books... Um, one thing I do, I think, is that I have conversations with other people's poems in my poems, and I'm not always sure that that's coming through to other people. Um, and there, you know, there's some great quote that's like, you know, bad poets borrow and good poets steal or something. Um, it feels a little akin to that. Uh, I don't think of it as stealing, but I do think of it as uh, de actually deliberate conversations a lot with my grandmother's poems, just because they're so ingrained in my mind, um, her voice, her lines, and especially in my last book, The Mobius Trip Club of Grief, is very specific moments in those books that are referencing specific moments in her poems too. Mm -hmm. um, and then in my newest book, there's a lot of sort of Easter egg moments referencing other poets and other philosophers and thinkers. Um, and it's something that um, all poets do. And um, I, I really love, I really love that element of poetry and it's definitely part of my um, craft. But again, I don't even notice it sometimes when I'm doing it. Uh, I think poems become so like, if you're, if you're a poet, then you read a lot of poetry and that's the joy, right? That's, that's, that's why I love poetry is not just writing it, it's reading it and rereading it. And these poems, especially poems early on in your life, they are really part of you. And I'm going on a tangent here, but like, I, I notice, you know, it can go wrong because if you try and write somebody else's poem, it's always a failure. And I see a lot of students doing that. I notice that I do it sometimes and I'm like, can't get this poem right. And then I'm like, oh, because it's not my poem. Um, switching to conversing with that poem and continuing conversation with that poem across time, that's the essence of poetry. So, um, right. No, that's great. That, that's long answer. such a broad answer. And I think it, it leads me into so many other questions that I can ask. Um, and I'm thinking, you know, yeah, I've always thought of poetry as a sort of ongoing conversation, right? We're in conversation with the poets before us, but then people after us will be in conversation with us, hopefully. Um, yeah. So I think that that, that is, is what's so um, fruitful and poignant and just thinking about the poems we take in when we read, how we kind of embody those in our own work maybe consciously or subconsciously. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of ways that we can go um, yeah. just from your answer there. Um, and something you mentioned too was, was kind of looking back at your poems and noticing more. So I just wondered when you sit down to write a poem, what's the process like? Is it, do you plan it out? Um, does it sort of kind of flow through? Is it a mix of both? Uh, I think one is always waiting for the moment for the muse to strike um, unawares, and those are great. It's rare, more rare, and I think the the trick about that is that you kind of have to be you have, you have to get more comfortable being in a poetic state of mind to allow those moments to come, and it's uh, it's also a job of learning to listen to your mind uh, and certain line, certain thoughts, right? It, it's 
really what poetry is is like is like editing your thoughts um and plucking choosing certain thoughts over other thoughts um so the more poetry you engage with the more your mind is sort of primed to to look for certain thoughts that you're having and um that's that's a real that's really a a, a great place it obviously it's a great place to be in it's it's one that you kind of have to work at um and that's i'm always so i'm always looking for those moments and if they come and i write down a line uh i then usually that's that's it it's a one line so then i have to sit down and sort of develop a poem from there um and a lot of my poetry that's kind of how it manifests right i i a, a stray line comes to me and I'm like, yes, this is it. And I sit down and I, I write it down in my journal or I type it on the computer. And then from there, I see what else happens be while I look at that line. And then from that line, you know, other, other associations start unfolding. Certain times I am haunted by a memory and I want to write about that thing. And those times are different because I don't have a line yet. And those are times are, are kind of harder because you really have a, and I see this too with students a lot too, it's like you have a story you really wanna tell. Um, you have a, you've witnessed something that seems significant and you wanna write a poem about it. Um, and that can overtake the magical musicality of like the lyricism that can happen. So it's, that's, that's a state of like finding a way into the poem uh, and and usually for that, I, I do read poetry to sort of get me in the mode. And I read people that make me want to write. Um, mm -hmm. So we all have specific people we go to and, you know, you know, somebody speaking to you more today than yesterday. You kind of have to shop around your bookshelf. But uh, you can't read a really good book of poetry and not want to write if you're a writer. It's just, yeah. But I was trying to, I've been, somebody solicited, asked me for poems and I'm like, oh, I have no, I have no finished poems. So I've been like urgently going through my, you know, drafts folder and they're all crap. And I'm like, ah, and so I feel like, like this panic, like I have got to get in the mode, you know? So I'm like, mm. I'm getting in the mode. I'm like, I keep printing out different versions of it and tinkering with it. And um, Yeah, I think that's it's nice to know that that's sort of a universal feeling, right? Kind of going back, I know my Google Drive is all these um, untitled drafts. And I'm like, maybe there's something really good in here this time. Like maybe this is this is the, the time that I'll sit down and be able to actually use whatever is in this this one untitled draft. And, and it, it is funny how um, we all kind of, we have that scramble and, and hope that, that we can make something of the, well, it's the initial fun. kernel it's fun to go into that folder and be like "Ooh, what did I do and like I read you know one poem I opened up and I was like wow I am embarrassed that I wrote this poem even though nobody's seen it I'm just I'm shocked that I'm capable of writing such crap you know um and then I open another poem and I'm like oh wow this is like unfamiliar to me even though I just wrote it and I forgot about it and it's kind of good and you know, it's just weird how it happened, but it's fun to like go into the folder and see what's in there you forget. Even if it's slightly horrifying. <laughs> well, then you get the pleasure of deleting it, you know. I, I'll i delete poems from existence. Uh, and I also have folders called like, no, never, you know. <laughs> I just like dump things in there. I'm like, for posterity's sake, you know, let the biographers years from now go through my crap, you know. Um, <laughs> other poems, I'm like, this is too humiliating to exist anywhere. And I think it's totally okay to delete poems as well. Yeah, I I think there's something about even if you delete it, if and then you're like, oh, I missed that one nugget. If it was really gonna be something it, it would come back to you and yeah. maybe even be um a better a better version of what it was mm -hmm. before I, I would like to believe that I'm gonna pop into the little chat window because it looks like we have some questions coming in um Kim 
is wondering, um, do you have a consistent method of moving towards a whole book collection? Um, like, do you have a sense of what a book is going to be and then write towards that? Or um, maybe do you have, do you get the poems first and then sort of figure out the configuration after that? It's really a combination of the two. Um, I don't, you know, I now, now in the later in my career, uh, I do, I'm starting to be like, I really want to make, for instance, a sequel to, <laughs> sequel, funny poetry book sequels to, to Mobius Strip Club of Grief. And like, I don't usually think like that way. Um, I don't, but I have no idea what it's going to look like um, or what its concerns are going to be, but I know there's more there that I want to plumb. Mostly, um, I start gathering, but first I pretend like I have a book. I say, to my editor, I've got a new book. Should I send it along? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, okay, now I'm going to put a book together. Um, and I gather, I start gathering my poems and I start going through and the, you know, just like we were talking about, like the going through your folder of random poems like that's a lot of work and it's exhausting and it's emotional and you feel like everything's horrible they're all the same poem blah 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 but you do it anyway and you start printing things out and putting them together and putting them into a pile and it slowly starts a theme themes start to emerge obviously um and the, the first step really is picking out the poems you like. You know, the first part is find, you know, gathering enough poems that you think are good enough. Maybe you've been publishing poems in magazines and that's sort of like a, that's like, a, usually that's like a validating enough thing where you're like, okay, um, this is okay for the book. Um, and for me, the book, it's all about the editing process for me. That's when the book happens and it doesn't happen before. And I don't plan things out at all. I'm really not a planner at all. I'm somebody who wants to edit and I want to get into the mode. And when I'm editing my poems, that's when new poems come. My new book was a shell of what it is now from the first draft that I gave to the editors to what came out. I wrote so many poems and so many poems radically changed and exploded into themselves, you know, because my method is really about like harnessing a certain energy that's like, feels a little bit like last minute panic, even though I have more time than last minute. But like, for me, like I do it when I send out too. Like if I'm sending out poems, uh, I'm like, okay, that's now or never. You got to like, you can't beat around the bush. You got to look at this poem for what it is and figure out what's wrong with it. And I do. I'm like, most of the time when I, I it gives me like a razor sharp focus and I'm like, I'm, I'm not going to, I can't tinker anymore. I've got to got to do it, but write this poem. Um, but yeah, I, I do a lot of manuscript consults and it's really become a joy to think about the construction of a book and all the different ways to do it. Um, and for me, it's what the most important thing is getting really excited about the editing process and really having fun with sculpting um, the themes and yeah. Great, yeah, I did wanna talk about your new book structure because it does feel a little bit different from the other collections which had this sort of numbered parts and these they're numbered in a way right dyad monad it kind of has this this sort of um numerical um feel to it but it's a little bit more thematic to me um so could you talk about how you fell upon those labels for the parts of the book and sort of um the overarching conceptual arc yeah um I had, you know, it's my third book of poetry and every time it's been such a learning experience. And by the time I got to this book, I have 
developed much more confidence in structure and I got really excited about it. Um, the, the, the Greek numbering is like, uh, it all came out of, this isn't the book, it all came out of um, my interest in the dyad. And I didn't know these other terms very well, um, but the dyad kind of found me through these sort of concerns and research I was doing um, on duality. And I had become quite interested in the inner unity of opposites and you know the two hands of God. And um, I was, so this, this idea of the dyad was really striking me and I had never really thought about it in this way and or nor realized how much information there is and in sort of places to go to investigate what it means and uh it did I was reading a lot of like Gnostic gospel texts at the time too and there's so much about the mystical power of numbers in these sacred texts and I was like you know like the number seven and stuff and um I got so that really interested me. And I, and I also find it interesting talking about paying attention uh, that my last book, The Mobius Strip Club of Grief was also um, interested in these sort of ancient math thing, you know, ancient math. I, I don't, I'm, when I said that in the beginning about me not being good in school, like I have, I have a very like, a huge amount of anxiety around math itself and I was always um I would just I, I had like a mental block against it for, for a really long time and it was really hard for me in school and I I never really got it somehow I slid by all the way through graduate school just really not knowing math um and it's always really bothered me and so you know I I I think I I blame the school systems entirely. Um, but I had this found this book in my grandmother's stuff called A Beginner's Guide to Constructing the Universe, The Mathematical Archetypes of Nature, Art, and Science, A Voyage from One to Ten. Mm -hmm. And this book is constructed around um, monad, dyad, triad, tetrad, pentad, hexad, all the way up till 10 to 10. Um, and that that's what gave me the idea for my book. Um, and the cool thing about that was I, I thought about what poems reflected the numbers and stuff like that. It, dyad was, I wanted to put everything in the dyad one, but I had to sort of like, <laughs> I couldn't do that. So I was like, you know, I'll put the mother poems in three because there's three of us, you know, like when you have a child, you like have a third. And um, obviously the, the, the almost the God ones are in a lot of the monad ones, as, as you noticed when your notes that you sent me and Right, so that that's sort of just like, you know, it's important to me. I don't know what's important, you know, it's subtle maybe in the book it's it's not you don't have to know any of this stuff but it's the kind of things that help you structure your books and and have fun with it and yeah i also think you know it kind of extends that conversation right because i was doing some research into these terms i mean obviously not as extensive as your research there um but you know it kind of it leaves branches in different ways of, of opening up um the poetry to to more things too so I really I always appreciate when a poem urges me to go look something up or when a book um I have the book open and I have like google open on on the other hand um so awesome. it's really I love great. That too. <laughs> um let me see in the chat I know there's a lot going on in here Anna has a question Oh, oh, I see a hand raise. Um, how do I do that? 
I think she just can unmute and ask it. I do have a journal for straight lines. I I write in a, just a spiral notebook. Hi, I did have a question. Okay. Is now a good time to ask? Sure. So we were just discussing in the chat, um, I had posted the question and we're getting, I got like two different answers. So I think there's some um, confusion. So I'm asking on behalf, I think of other people as well. Um, Bianca, when you mentioned some of your poetry stemming from your experience reading the Gnostic Gospels. I was curious as to whether that's your Mobius Strip Club of Grief book or the What's Otherwise Infinite. And I guess we're not sure which one. I meant I meant What is Otherwise Infinite. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. I really enjoy the Gnostic Gospels myself. So that's something I'm curious about. <laughs> it's, I mean, there's endless, endless material and it's all really incredibly interesting and engaging. And, Gives you such a different perspective on God and religion. Yeah. Humanity. Ancient Jewish mysticism too, you know, in there. So thank you. Great. Um, so Bianca, you mentioned kind of just now when we were talking about structuring um the new book, seeing looking back and seeing some similarities um with the Mobius Strip Club of Grief. And um I wondered if if you could talk a little bit about how you move from sort of what feels very much like a project book for the second book into this new collection, which is, which is very broad and covers so many different themes like motherhood, spirituality, um, the sort of existential kind of dread um, and unknowingness. Um, so maybe just the process of, of getting over that sophomore um, hump of the second book to the third. Yeah, I, I don't know. I just, you know, I follow the poems and I, you know, looking back at the Mobius Strip Club of Grief, it was, it's almost, it's almost like I was half in the project and half out. I, I don't think I, fully committed to the conceit or something like it goes in other places too um and the poems do stand alone but I think all I can say is with my new book I I you know I was concerned with myself with they're all like my brain but like um my first book felt like I was writing it for my husband or something. And like, I was writing it not just for him, but like about love and how it was both beautiful and also very destructive. How some people say they love you, but they're actually really harming you and how, you know, and then his love was like this new love that I had never experienced before. And then the second book was like, obviously like a lot about my grandmother and my family. And I felt like I was, exploring that realm and then this book I was like I felt like I was it was much more about my experience but really just the human experience in general and I I, I don't know if that answers your question but like I I want to I wanted to follow my concerns and I mm -hmm. felt like I was on a you know it's always a it's always a personal investigation. You know, you're always trying to figure something out and you don't figure it all out, but you know, you, it's sort of more about the journey of, of the investigation. And um, again, just reiterating that, you know, every book is in a kind of experiment and uh, in every book I become more confident in my concerns and I think what can happen with project books is that people think oh this will be an easy sell or mm -hmm. um it it kind of validates your writing in a way you know that because you know people will say oh, what's your book about I'm like Ugh. <laughs> you know I, I I I kind of hate I get it I get it of course um and I like to talk about the poems, but like, I feel this anxiety 
about like it having to be about something. And I think project books are like a way to talk about that more easily. And um, I, I also, I'm a big lover of the single poem, you know, the, 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 the one-off poem. Uh, and I remember back when my first book came out, it was project books were very popular and people were like, I remember one person was like, it's kind of like, just like a book with a bunch of random poems in it. And I was like, that's just what, that's what books and poems are. They, they, they're just books with poems in them, you know? Like, what do you want from me? Um, they, yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's comforting. I think I've heard from poets as well. There's, there's sort of a yearning to go back to poetry books that were like these are the best poems I have and they're in a book together because they're the poems I have and and that um is hopefully enough you know they're they're there and you know I wrote them all so that's that's the connection and you know of course themes recur and and we all kind of circle back to to what's um obsessing us at the moment but um yeah no I I totally understand that that sort of anxiety um what's it about because it can be about so many things yeah um, yeah Adam's saying um all the poems are, are always talking to each other that's true mm -hmm. um Michelle is wondering um how you decide which poems go into the crap pile um like what might be missing from them um to you that that you feel you you may be don't have the space um, to to work on or transform. Yeah, that, and that, that's another great thing about getting older is, and you know, having a lot of time that you've been writing is that you get better at discerning what's crap and what isn't. Um, and it always, as you all probably know, takes a little bit of distance from the poem. Um, that's why oftentimes I'll write a poem and just dump it into the folder and then I'll look at it later. Um, and it, you know, I'm sure you all know this too, is that you can really think you've written something great. And uh, it, you know, literally I looked at a poem that I thought had thought was so great. And I looked at it and probably three weeks after I wrote it and, I was embarrassed. Um, it was so like self-pitying or something. You know, those are the really bad ones where it's like you think you're being like interesting, but you're really just like bitching or something. Um, you really need to get something out, but it's just not working. Um, I usually can tell. Look, there's there's a poem right here that I've been working on, um, and it's like I keep trying to make it work. And I like a lot of the lines, but I'm not sure what all what it all is pointing towards or how it hangs together. And it might be three poems, might be two poems actually. Um, but sometimes it's just too much of a mess, you know, and you gotta move on. You gotta just like put it, let it go. I don't, you know, the, some that I don't hate, I'm not embarrassed by, but they're not, they're just too much of a mess. Like. I keep them and I find them later and I look at them and it's enjoyable to look at them um, remembering back to that time and what I was trying to do. Maybe there's literally one line or even one word that I'll carry over to a new poem. Um, I think our greatest deception is that we can't, we can't move on from a poem, you know, that, mm -hmm. that we must fix this poem and Usually the poem that's driving you crazy, um, that you can't get right, that you've been tinkering with forever, usually the poem after that poem will be a good poem. Um, but yeah, just it's, it's really just the poems have their own fucking consciousness. I can't even, it's like another being and sometimes <laughs> want to be right right uh, someone mentioned like why did I edit the Marcus Aurelius poem um that one it's funny I put it like first in the book it driving me crazy trying to get simple lines right 
Mm -hmm. um, and I still feel dissatisfied with it. I still wish I could edit it. Um, but yeah, I think I, you know, I probably could have just kept it the same. It would have been fine. Um, but I was trying to be more accurate about something in the beginning. I think it was the beginning of that poem that I changed. Um, I don't know, honey, I'm in the middle of a reading. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. You know, it's funny that like the original version's out there. <laughs> <laughs> Do you often edit kind of posts, maybe like a lit mag publication or, or um, something? Um, Do you go back and edit before it makes it into the book frequently or? Um, how's that tinkering process work for you? I don't like doing that, but I will. I don't care. I can. I think, you know, I think some poets will edit. I, I don't know if it's true. I think Louise Gluck did edit her poems that ended up in the collected um, from her first book or something like that. Uh, I don't know. Some of my grandma's poems I've edited the spelling, um, things like that uh, in the new version since, um, it's not, I don't like, yeah, I don't like doing it, but I will do it. Yeah, because you sometimes, you know, what comes out in a magazine is just, it's just an early version and you have every right to change it. And Walt Women changed Leaves of Grass like three times and drastically and, um, people all can argue about the different versions, you know, forever, <laughs> and that's kind of fun, too. Poems are never finished, only abandoned. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about figurative language. Um, so many of, of these awesome, surprising, and often kind of humorous moments in your work, um, come through the, these amazing similes um, and a lot of maybe what could be part of those those conversations with other poets like Rilke and, and Proust, um, even like Nancy Drew comes in to this book, um, come through in like the similes and metaphors. So could you just talk about how you lean into those surprising elements of language, um, which maybe is also a little bit about, you know, trust, trust in your own mental leaps, but maybe trust in the reader as well. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sure what, what the question is. Um, yeah, um, just maybe talking a little bit about your approach to to figurative language, um, and maybe even even kind of humor, that kind of dark humor, um, and and how you lean into those moments in the poems. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, like I was saying earlier, uh, that a lot of poetry seems to be about um, listening to your own thoughts. And the way the mind works is very interesting um, and non sequitur and um, fraught with contradictions and associations and um, memory, of course. Um, and I like it's really about learning to listen to the way your mind works um, as well as, you know, establishing a kind of rhythm and music. And we do this probably naturally in conversation too. Uh, we try to have a certain cadence and um, present a certain self through our, uh, the way that I'm doing it right now, the way that we um, sculpt the words coming out of our mouth. Poetry just seems to be a much more intense version of that. For me, um, you know, these convert, the, these, these things that I'm reading and looking at, like, it's not a vacuum. Like I'm, I'm, I'm reading them and I'm responding to them in completely my own way. 
you know i i think so much of the time we think we read we must respond in a certain way to as based upon how we're taught to respond in school um how we're supposed to write poems and uh what's okay and what's not okay in a poem and um you know those information that information can be helpful in some ways uh but essentially my interest in poetry is um finding a strange beauty in language um, to engage somebody's interest. And that comes with a lot of focusing in on the sounds of words alone, mm -hmm. um, even over meaning and being like, what is it, you know, this word next to this word, it sounds so interesting, you know, and I don't know why. And there's a, there's a kind of electricity between these two words and just really dorking out over the, um, the kind of collaging of language in lines. Uh, and it goes line by line, of course. Um, one second, my, my child, what, what, what's up baby? Okay, well, I'll figure it out later. Sorry. Um, and the humor seems important too, because I think, you know, without humor, we're just screwed. I, I, I mean, I deal with some um, upsetting themes that, you know, we all have ups very upsetting themes that live in us, um, that we've experienced and that we think purely. Um, and the humor, the humor is just, it's it's like reality, you know? It's like, it is, it's like the absurdity or something. Um, the humor is the ridiculousness of it um, and the seriousness of it. Um, it's like dramas on TV, you know, they're always better when they're a little funny. If they're all just drama, it's like, you just wanna die, you know? It's just too much. Yeah, that little, that little break in, in the, the heightened sort of state brings in that sort of release and, and propels you forward, so, mm -hmm. which is, yeah, I feel a lot of that in these poems. And I think I felt that too in the Mobius Strip Club of Grief as well, especially poems dealing with more, you know, those complex emotions and the, the humor kind of comes and and takes you by surprise um, in really beautiful ways and kind of keeps you going through um, through the poems and wanting more of that. So um, I'm a big fan of, of it all. <laughs> Thanks. Um, all right, we are getting close to the end of our time. Um, Anne-Marie in the chat is saying, many writers just starting out tend to carry with us an anxiety or fear of being emotionally exposed. Um, writing poetry is such an intimate journey of self-discovery. Do you have any suggestions on how to conquer those self-defeating thoughts or fears? It's not an easy thing. I, you know, sometimes I'm like, what am I doing? Um, you know, I, I kind of, one freaks out when their book comes out. Uh, one, one can have <laughs> mini nervous breakdown um, because of that fact. Um, you need to remember though, that first of all, you should always sort of know your threshold. Um, some things, maybe you're not ready to put in a poem and put out there. Uh, it doesn't mean you can't write it and keep it until you are ready. But um, the truth is sort of otherwise. The truth is sort of once you do it, it's actually very freeing. Um, and there's a great, appreciation from the audience that you've done it because they relate to it um, and they relate to the vulnerability of it. You also need to remember that this is poetry we're talking about. There is a huge benefit to talking about um, emotionally exposing things in poetry because poetry has a veil of ambiguity to it that is very 
um, is very helpful in that way. And I think, you know, writing a memoir, couldn't do it. Um, not traditionally, you know, I, poetry gives you a chance to get at the subtle, um, unknowable things of our experiences that aren't, aren't as obvious. Um, and in that way, I think that ambiguity that can happen, that, that you know, um, tell the truth, but tell it slant, Emily Dickinson sort of idea. Uh, th that's why almost like, I, that's why I appreciate poetry so much is that I'm able to talk about very difficult themes um, and I can control the tone, say, I give it a sort of wry humor to it, even though it's a poem about something very upsetting. To me, that's a way that I'm able to talk about something very hard or, um, you know, the Mobius Strip Club of Grief is a good example of some themes that are un unspeakable. Um, and I found a way to talk about them um, indirectly. So with symbolism and um, through other, you know, this, this made up landscape was able to talk about a landscape that was really difficult for me. So, um, but all that said, I, I have a huge amount of anxiety about my book. I feel very exposed sometimes, um, but I, I keep, saying, you know, I tr you know, trust the poems. I trust um, people, you know, I think hearing back from people like, oh, your poem meant so much to me, you know, that makes it well worth it. You know, they're like, I felt like you were writing about me. They say that it's not about me anymore. It's not about my life story. These poems are for other people and I'm not the speaker, even though I am, but it's not me anymore. You know, that's, that's, that's the poem now. And I think what what a great what a great gift that can be. Um, but a legit question for sure. Yeah, yeah. And that answer was was such a gift. I think it's the perfect way to wrap up our time tonight. Unfortunately, this is always the worst part, having having to say goodbye um, right when we're in in the thick of it, in the meat of the the conversation, but thank you, Bianca, so much for just sharing um, your poems and your insights. Please, 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 everyone buy the book. It is so, so good. Um, buy all of Bianca's books. Um, you won't regret it. And um, Bianca, if you want to do a last plug for um, the Ruth Stone House or, or anything you have coming up, yeah, uh, check out the Roostone House at roostonehouse.org. Um, we will be posting some new classes in the coming week. And um, we are soon going to be posting about a, a week-long writer's retreat. Uh, I'll be teaching a class at this summer in Vermont, so in person. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. Really Thank wonderful. Thank you, audience, for your wonderful questions as well um these are always my favorite nights to, to yeah. spend talking about poetry so thank you bianca for your time yes and i'm saving the chat so i can look at your questions thank you guys so much all right have a great one thank you emily thank you